Rich and powerful people very often get away with a lot. They use their power and influence to get off the hook for all manner of things all the time. This very often happens among the nobility, the top-tier elite of British society, some of whom are apparently so far above us that they don't even sweat. But even being an aristocrat and a lord, with very powerful connections to some of the most powerful people and families in all of Britain, well, that can only take you so far when you become the prime suspect in a murder case. You could maybe take the risk and hang around and try to pull some strings, or you can completely vanish without a trace. The Disappearance of Lord Lucan Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Raycon. With Raycon earbuds, you can greatly enhance your listening experience with incredible quality at half the price of other premium audio brands. The new everyday earbuds are better than ever with an improved rubber look and feel that is both sleek and stylish. They have been specifically modified through many design iterations to seamlessly fit the curvature of your ears, as well as including various optimized gel tips for your comfort and security, regardless of the size of your ears. Previous customers have given over 50,000 five-star reviews online. And Raycons are now more adaptable than ever, with a built-in mic that allows you to take a call at the push of a button, and it includes easy-to-use media controls. They are also compatible with both Siri and Alexa, and include three audio profiles for you to customise your listening experience. Enjoy your music and videos with high-quality bass and passive noise isolation for true immersion. Raycons are also resistant to sweat and water, so they can survive being accidentally put through the washing machine or being dropped in a puddle. They offer up to 54 hours of battery life and since Christmas is coming up, I would say that a pair of Raycons would be a very convenient gift for most of your family and friends. And Raycon have made it easy for you over the Christmas period by including holiday gift guides to make buying gifts for your loved ones a much smoother experience. As for my American viewers, you can now buy Raycons at your local Walmart and Coles, but you can always get a better deal from buyraycon.com slash dankula. So if you want to get some top tier earbuds while also supporting my channel, then click my link down in the description box down below or go to buyraycon.com slash dankula to get an exclusive deal of up to 15% off site wide by using the code HOLIDAY. There will also be new pop-up deals every day during Raycon's countdown to Christmas and I'll try to keep the description box updated with the latest offers. But just so you know, you can always go to buyraycon.com slash dankula to get the best deals available on Raycon. John Bingham, the 7th Earl of Lucan, was born as Richard John Bingham on the 18th of December 1934 in Marlebone, London. He was the eldest son of George Bingham, 6th Earl of Lucan, and his wife, Caitlin Dawson. His mother had been diagnosed with a blood clot in her lung, so she was bedridden for a very long time. And John was raised by a nursery maid named Lucy Sellers. Just before World War II broke out, John Bingham became an evacuee, and he was sent to live in Wales with his sister. During World War II, children were sent out from cities to go live in the countryside to keep them safe from the Blitzkrieg bombings. But eventually he and his other siblings were sent to Canada to live with a multi-millionaireess named Marcia Brady Tucker. But shortly after their arrival, they moved to America instead. While staying with her, John lived a life of luxury and safety away from the war. But when it was time for him and his siblings to return, London seemed like a grim life in comparison, especially after the Blitz. Food rationing was also still in place too, so they couldn't eat like they could in America. The realities of coming home from a dream life and finding out their family home had been bombed and seeing the destruction everywhere, 
made John develop night terrors, which meant he had to start seeing a therapist. After some time, John travelled to Windsor to attend Eton College, which is the big poshest fuck school that pretty much all of our Prime Ministers have been to. While at Eton, John developed a love of gambling, and he would make some money from the other students by bookmaking and then attending horse races to place his own bets. As for his education, he did the bare minimum that he had to do in order to pass. He left Eton in 1953 due to being obligated to do his national service. He was placed as the second lieutenant of the Coldstream Guards and he was stationed in West Germany from 1953 to 1955. The Coldstream Guards are the oldest serving regiment in the British Army to this day. During his service when they were on their downtime, John really loved playing poker with his squad, which further added to his love of gambling. After leaving the military, he became a merchant banker in London for a company called William Brandt Sons and Co. And when he wasn't working, he became a professional gambler. He was an early member of a group known as the Claremont Club, which was an exclusive group of wealthy gamblers. John would win regularly at games such as backgammon and bridge, but he would also lose a lot of money on some occasions. His worst being a £10,000 loss at a casino, which in those days, that's, that's a brutal amount of money to lose. Even so, John quit his job at the bank because he was making more money on one gambling night than he would make in his entire year of working at the bank. And he was also angry that he got passed up for promotion. After John's father died, the title of 7th Lord Lucan was passed down to him, and from this point on, he would be referred to as Lord Lucan, or the 7th Earl of Lucan. But in the gambling scene, he was nicknamed Lucky Lucan. As time went on, he slowly became more and more addicted to gambling and alcohol, although financially he still seemed to be doing pretty well for himself. In 1963, Lord Lucan married Veronica Duncan, who was from a military family. She hadn't met her father since he had died when she was just two years old, but he reached the rank of major in the Royal Field Artillery at only 22 years old, and he was even awarded the Military Cross for his services. The wedding ceremony was attended by a lot of high society people, and even a princess. Also, in case anyone is raising an eyebrow at someone somehow becoming a major at 22, this was during World War I, where the average life expectancy was about three hours. So, a 22-year-old major in World War I? Not that unusual. Lord Lucan started a family with his new wife relatively fast, and in a short space of time, they had three children. In 1967, they moved into an area of London known as Lower Belgrave Street in Belgravia, and the house only cost them £17,500, which in modern London is now the monthly rent on a one-bedroom flat. After their first child, they immediately hired a nanny, which was customary at the time, especially for wealthy families. Looking, however kept trying to mould Veronica into someone she wasn't. He tried to teach her about gambling, hunting, and he even paid for her to take golf lessons, none of which she had any interest in at all. Lord Lucan had a very strict routine of spending his mornings, as most men at the time did, by reading the papers, having a coffee, and answering any letters he may have received. But... The rest of his day was spent at the Claremont Club, eating lavish meals and gambling. He would even drag his wife along to his gambling sessions where she would have to sit on what was called the widow's chair with all of the other wives so that they could all sit there and watch their husbands gamble until four in the morning. In 1966, due to Lord Lucan's love for fast and expensive cars and boats, he was actually considered for the role of James Bond. 
But he actually declined the role and instead entered into a screen test for a part in a movie called Woman Times Seven, which ultimately didn't go anywhere. So yeah, Lord Lucan was almost James Bond. After the birth of Lord Lucan's two other children, his wife Veronica fell into postnatal depression, which had been building anyway due to Lord Lucan not being a very attentive father or husband. She grew tired of worrying about their finances after all of the major gambling losses that Lucan seemed to always be suffering, and also the pressures of having to be who Lucan wanted her to be, where she would have to sit and smile and pretend that she was happy and interested in all of the same things that Lucan was when she wasn't. In 1972, their marriage inevitably failed and came to an end. He may have been known as Lucky Lucan by his friends at the Claremont Club, but his family would feel it the most whenever he lost a game. And this ended up being too much for the marriage. The separation was very messy. Lord Lucan moved to a property nearby to Veronica and his children in hopes that they would be able to fix their marriage. But, despite the fact that they were separated, Lord Lucan couldn't deal with the fact that he wasn't able to control everything that Veronica did like he had always done. So, she moved to take custody of the children, which further angered Lord Lucan. Lord Lucan wanted to prove that she was an unfit mother, partly due to her depression and anxiety. So, he started to spy on her to gather evidence to his favour, usually by parking right outside of the house at all hours of the day and night, even going to the extent of hiring private detectives to collect information on her and intimidate her. It was almost like one of his games at the Claremont Club and he was absolutely desperate to win. The private detectives were not the only people that he approached to gather evidence either. He started to visit doctors and tried to pressure them into proving that his wife was insane. But all of them refused to lie on his behalf. In an effort to ruin Veronica, Lord Lucan would tell all of his friends that none of them should ever help her and simply just turn their noses up at her if they ever saw her in public. In March of 1973, Lucan approached the nanny that he had hired while she was in public with his children, and he had two private detectives backing him up. Lord Lucan then pulled a big brain move. Lucan fired her on the spot, which then instantly made the children wards of the court meaning that the nanny had no choice but to hand the children over to him right then and there. Veronica had her own disparaging stories about Lord Lucan, on one occasion telling a nanny that he had beaten her with a cane, and on another occasion he had thrown her down the stairs. She also expressed fears that Lord Lucan might one day kill her. In the business, etc, etc. Though, when she attempted an appeal to the court to have her children return to her, she was denied, until the judge called them back to court three months later in June of 1973. While Veronica had some time to herself, she went for a physical and psychiatric evaluation at a clinic, which required her to stay for a few days for observation. The reason that she did this was so that when Lord Lucan inevitably brought up her mental state in the courtroom, she would have evidence to the contrary. Whereas Lord Lucan would have no evidence whatsoever since all of the doctors refused to lie for him. On the day of court, the judge saw straight through Lord Lucan and he handed custody of the children to Veronica. The exact reasoning for this was that the judge was unimpressed by Lord Lucan's behaviour and character, and likely the treatment of his wife. This judgement made Lord Lucan furious to an almost psychotic extent. He made sure that no one contacted Veronica, and he also spread rumours about her. And all the while, the spying got worse. 
He had started recording her phone conversations and the nanny reported hearing heavy breathing down the phone as well as a man asking to speak to people that didn't actually live there. And she knew that these calls were from Lord Lucan. He even stole his wife's medication and took it to the pharmacist to identify what it was. And it turns out she was just taking Limbitrol 5, which is for depression and anxiety, which under the circumstances isn't really much of a surprise. Anything that Lord Lucan could do to make Veronica feel powerless to his control, he would do it. On top of his spying, he still continued to gamble losing vast amounts of money, eventually having to let go of his private detectives since he was running out of cash. The spying continued, however, as Lucan had become close with the current nanny working for Veronica, and she would report everything back to Lord Lucan. That is until the end of 1974, when Veronica got a new nanny, a woman named Sandra Eleanor Rivet, which put an end to the information being fed back to Lucan. Lord Lucan was at the edge of financial ruin, and he had become dependent on alcohol. He considered borrowing money to buy his children back, but no one would lend him the large amount he was asking for because they knew he would just spend it on gambling and his other addictions. Lord Lucan's mind began to unravel. Even his own friends were becoming very concerned because Lord Lucan kept telling veiled jokes about murdering Veronica. So, with his life pretty much in ruins, Lord Lucan lost his mind. And then, the shit hit the fan. The new nanny, Sandra, had a very strict routine, and she would take Thursday nights off for personal time, usually going for dinner with her boyfriend. Except for one occasion where she swapped her night off. A fatal mistake. On Thursday evening, after getting the children ready for bed, Sandra went down into the basement kitchen to make Veronica a cup of tea, and as she walked into the room, a bandaged lead pipe came down on her head. Veronica wondered why Sandra was taking so long and heard the commotion from upstairs. So, she called down to see if Sandra was okay, but all she heard in response was Sandra screaming for her life and a man's voice telling her to shut up. Lord Lucan had broken into the house, but he obviously didn't expect Sandra to be there, so he murdered her. Lord Lucan had stuffed Sandra's body into a large mailbag, and then he made his way up the stairs to deal with Veronica who was frozen with fear as she watched a blood-stained Lord Lucan slowly climbing the stairs while staring at her. At first, he acted as though nothing at all had happened while he approached Veronica, who couldn't help but notice that the basement was completely silent and she couldn't hear Sandra. Lucan then admitted that he had killed Sandra. Of course, Veronica freaked out and Lord Lucan grabbed a hold of her smashing her head on the floor, and then he started strangling her. Veronica struggled to leave his grasp until, finding every man's weak point, she grabbed his balls and squeezed them as hard as she could, which, of course, made Lucan let go. Veronica then took on a more submissive approach in order to keep Lucan calm and trick him into thinking that she would do what he says. But at the first chance she could, she escaped through a bathroom window and then ran down the street calling for help towards a pub called the Plumber's Arms. By this point, Lord Lucan knew he was absolutely fucked. The plan wasn't to kill Sandra, but to kill Veronica. He planned it all out as well, but he never expected Sandra to switch her shift. Lord Lucan then called his mother to come and collect the children, who were all still asleep in their beds. When she asked what was wrong, he just said there had been a terrible catastrophe, and that is all he would tell her. Veronica then received a psychotic call saying nonsensical sentences that she couldn't understand, but before she could answer, the caller put the phone down. 
Veronica was then taken to the local hospital because she had suffered injuries during the attack. While she was there, the police broke down the door of the crime scene. They made their way down the heavily bloodstained stairs into the basement, where they discovered Sandra's body. Her arm was seen sticking out of the mail sack that she had been shoved into, as well as a pool of blood at the base of the bag. One of the light bulbs at the bottom of the stairs had actually been removed and placed nearby. It's assumed that Lucan did this to make the room darker, to make an ambush easier. The weapon that he used to crush her skull was laying in the middle of the floor, still covered in a bloody drag. And the reason I'm describing this to you is because there actually are photos of the crime scene online, but I can tell you right now, YouTube won't like me showing them. Meanwhile, the police went to search number 5 Eaton Row, which is the house that Lord Lucan had moved into after the breakup. They interviewed his mother and anyone else that might know his whereabouts, but all the police found at the address was Lord Lucan's suit and shirt lying on the bed, alongside his wallet, money, licenses, car keys, handkerchief, glasses, and a book on Greek shipping millionaires. He hadn't even taken his passport, and since all of his keys were there, so was his Mercedes-Benz, which was part right outside. But there was absolutely no sign of Lord looking. I guess they'll just have to keep looking. Look, I'm sorry, I had to do it at least once in the video. The police visited Veronica at the hospital to question her. She managed to answer most of what was asked despite being heavily medicated due to her injuries. After the questioning, they deemed her to be unsafe, so while they continued their investigation, she would be under guard 24-7. She told the police everything, that Lord Lucan had murdered Sandra and was then going to kill her. And so, began the search for Lord Lucan. And this is the strangest part of the story, and it still lives on to this day. They could not find him anywhere. Anywhere. They checked his usual hangouts, his properties, the Claremont Club, they interviewed his friends, they even interviewed distant associates and contacts that he might be hiding with. They searched absolutely everywhere. The police even questioned other men fitting the description that Veronica gave them, just so they could rule out other suspects. But, despite their efforts, they could find no sign of Lord Lucan anywhere. The police were so lost in trying to find Lord Lucan that they eventually had to put out public broadcasts through television, radio and newspapers. But they didn't say that he was wanted for murder, because in typical fashion for the upper classes and their keeping up appearances, they simply said that they just wanted to find him for questioning. So, the news was doing the same business as usual and only telling the public part of the story. Because who are you peasants to question the moral actions of a lord? We might do illegal shit all the time, but quite frankly, that is none of your business. Pleb. But then, just as the police thought they would never hear from Lord Lucan again, Lucan made a phone call to his mother, most likely to ask her about looking after the children. When his mother asked him to speak to the police, Lucan said no and that he would call them himself later. Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Ranson, the officer managing the case, found out that after Lucan had killed Sandra, he went to go and stay with two of his friends, Ian Maxwell Scott and his wife in Uckfield, East Sussex. Lucan tried to make up a bunch of stories to cover up what he had done when he was explaining the situation to his brother-in-law in a letter. He said that Veronica had at first lied, and then he said that he had actually hired an assassin to kill Veronica and Sandra. But the evidence for Lord Lucan committing the act himself was pretty overwhelming. He also said that he believes that Veronica now hates him, well, well, yeah. Lucan went on to say that he didn't want his children 
to be brought up by her, especially with them believing that their father is now a murderer. Which, which, which he is. The last thing that he wanted his brother-in-law to do was to explain what paranoia is to the children when they are old enough, so that they would think that Veronica was crazy. You know, just all classic projection. While the investigation continued and Lord Lucan was still on the run, Lucan and Veronica's children were sent to live with their aunt for a few weeks until things had been sorted. Lucan's friends, Ian and his wife, were questioned as to why they didn't tell the police that a wanted fugitive was staying with them, and they simply said that they hadn't seen, read or heard any of the broadcasts. Superintendent Roy Ranson intercepted Lucan's letters and allegedly found that they had small amounts of blood on them from both Sandra and Veronica, which showed how much of a rush he was in since it seemed that he hadn't even had a bath since the incident. Then the police had tracked his next step. They found a Ford Corsair that an eyewitness claimed Lord Lucan was seen driving just 16 miles away from his friend's house in Uckfield. In the boot of the car, they found some pretty damning evidence. They found another lead pipe wrapped in surgical tape that Lucan had made, just like the one he used in the basement on Sandra. And they also found a bottle of vodka, and as we all know, Lucan was an alcoholic. Inside the car, they also found hair that looked very similar to that of Veronica's, but it was found in such quantities that could only be explained by the hair being ripped out during an attack. But just as the police seemed to be getting close, the 8th of November 1974 was the last time that Lord Lucan was seen or heard. At first, Superintendent Ranson believed that Lucan had committed suicide, saying that it was a fitting end for him to fall on his own sword, and also everyone that knew Lucan actually started to believe it too, because he made no contact at all with anyone whatsoever. And since he frequented high society clubs, he was the talk of the town among the elite for a very long time. People came up with a bunch of stories of how he ended his life, one of them being that he tied a giant rock around his legs and jumped in the English Channel. This became one of the biggest mysteries in British history, and it also became one of the biggest pieces of gossip and media fodder for decades. It was a major story. A modern equivalent would be like Jacob Rees-Mogg, 360 no scope in his butler, and then just vanishing completely without a trace. Think of how huge a story that would be. Well, that is what this was like. A member of the House of Lords murdered someone and then just completely vanished. Just gone completely, and they have never been found to this day. And still, to this day, people are still hunting for clues, and they are trying to answer the question, where the fuck is Lord Lucan? Years after Lucan had disappeared, the title of Lord Lucan VIII was denied to his son, because there had not yet been a death certificate. No body, no death. This meant that his son couldn't inherit the title and take a seat in the House of Lords, which I can't have much sympathy for because the House of Lords is a giant pile of bullshit. Anyway, the doubts on whether he was alive, dead or on the run didn't help. Even Superintendent Ranson changed his mind and decided that Lucan wasn't man enough to put an end to himself. And it was likely that he had escaped to South Africa. Others believe that he was smuggled out of the country by an unknown criminal organisation to Switzerland, where he lived until he died sometime in the 90s. There have also been thousands of reported sightings worldwide since his disappearance that have led to many poor bastards being stalked and harassed because they kind of looked like Lord Lucan. In 1982, a bounty hunter named John Miller kidnapped a random guy 
<laughs> and tried to pass him off as Lord Lucan in order to claim a reward that hadn't even been offered. But the hoax was very quickly seen through and he got in a little bit of trouble for, you know, kidnapping someone. In 2003, a detective for Scotland Yard claimed that he had spotted Lord Lucan living in a hippie commune in Goa, India. His position with the police likely helped give credence to his claims, but after an investigation, it was discovered that it was just another innocent man. He was really just a locally well-known hippie folk singer named Barry Halpin. A quick rundown of other instances of false reports about Lord Lucan include uh, apparently him being spotted living in an ex-Nazi colony in Paraguay, uh, working as a waiter in San Francisco, and also owning a sheep station in the Australian outback. All of the people that were falsely accused uh, all ended up getting harassed. Lord Lucan was eventually declared dead, and a death certificate was issued on the 3rd of February 2016. At this time, Lord Lucan would have been 81 years old. And, because a death certificate had finally been issued, Lord Lucan's son could finally claim his title as Lord Lucan VIII and get his special little chair in the House of Lords. Despite the death certificate, many people believe that Lord Lucan is still alive, and even to this day, people claim to have spotted him all over the world. Things did not end too well for Veronica, however. Possibly due to the lifelong trauma that she experienced after the tragic marriage to Lord Lucan and the things that he did to her, she ended up taking her own life at the age of 80 in 2017 by taking a cocktail of pills and alcohol. So, after the final phone call to his mother, we have absolutely no idea at all of what happened to Lord Lucan. Never mind where the fuck he is. How could he have left the country if he left all of his IDs and passports behind? Well, if you're rich and powerful, it's probably easy to get fakes or bribe your way onto a ship. Maybe he didn't even leave the country at all and he bought himself a little cottage in the Highlands and lived his life out there in obscurity. Maybe he went out into the wilderness and self-deleted and the wild animals just kind of, you know, took care of the rest. No one has any idea whatsoever. There haven't even been any clues. Maybe we could have hoped for a deathbed confession, you know, just some dying guy living in Timbuktu just announcing it in his last moments. By the way, I'm Lord Lucan right before he passes away. But given that as of filming this, Lord Lucan would be 87 years old. And given his love of gambling, the fact he was a heavy smoker, and the fact that he was an alcoholic, I think it's safe to say that he's already dead. So, what happened to Lord Lucan? And more importantly, where is Lord Lucan? Well, a lesson that you learn in life is there are just some things that you're never going to know. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!